Dripping down science. The Naked Scientists. Hello, it's Sunday, February the 20th, 2011. Welcome to The Naked Scientists with me, Ben Valsler. And me, Dave Ansell. This week, we look to the skies to explore the science of atmospheric chemistry. We'll be finding out why researchers have commissioned a modified airliner to fly around the UK at night, sampling the air and following plumes of pollution. We'll find out how we could change the atmosphere through geoengineering. We'll ask what chemistry we'd need to rely on, but also explore the engineering challenges of delivering chemicals into the stratosphere. In the news, we'll find out how an isolated population of people in Ecuador may hold the genetic key to a disease-free life, and how hibernating bears slow their metabolic rate far more than expected and may one day help to get us beyond the stars. Plus how rocks in Death Valley seem to move around on their own and how rerouting nerves can allow amputees to move a prosthetic limb more naturally than ever before. So if you would like to ask a question or make a comment about the show, get in touch. To contact us through Twitter, tweet at Naked Scientists, write on our Facebook page, that's thenakedscientist.com slash Facebook, or drop us an email to chris at thenakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UK Fast, the UK's best hosting provider. On the web at ukfast.co.uk. This is The Naked Scientists with me, Ben Valsler, and with Dave Ansell. And first up, let's take a look at some of this week's top science news stories. An isolated population of people in Ecuador could hold the genetic key to a long and healthy life, according to research published in the journal Science Translational Medicine this week. It's known that mutations in growth signalling pathways can extend lifespan and reduce genetic damage in model organisms like yeast and nematode worms, and even reduce insulin resistance and cancer rates in mice. To find out what effect mutations in similar genes may have on humans, Jime Guevara Aguirre at the Institute of Endocrinology, Metabolism and Reproduction in Quito, Ecuador, Volta Longo at the University of Southern California and their colleagues have studied a group of 99 related people who all displayed a mutation in the growth hormone receptor or GHR gene, most of them having the E180 mutation, where the resultant protein lacks eight amino acids and as such cannot fold into the correct shape. As a result of having this mutation, their growth is limited. Now, the subjects themselves have actually been observed since 1988, and information on illness and death has been collected for a further 53 GHR-deficient relatives, as well as 1,606 relatives of the cohort that didn't have the GHR deficiency, so they were normal height. This allowed the researchers to look at causes of illness and death in both of these populations to see if there were any significant differences. Cancer accounted for 17% of all diseases and 20% of all deaths in the unaffected relatives. But it was actually not recorded as a cause of death for anybody in the GHR deficient population. Likewise, there were no reported cases of diabetes in the affected population and blood tests revealed significantly lower levels of insulin. Now, this tells us that there's something about this mutation that increases insulin sensitivity. However, there was no evidence of an extended lifespan for the affected population, and this might be due to the high proportion of deaths caused by non-age-related diseases, like convulsive disorders or things like alcohol toxicity and accidents. So to try and explain what might be going on, the researchers took human cells and incubated them with serum from either the GHR-deficient subjects or from their non-affected relatives, and then exposed these cells to a highly oxidising solution of hydrogen peroxide. Now, while individual cells incubated with the GHR-deficient serum showed less DNA damage there was also a higher level of apoptosis or programmed cell death amongst the population of cells. Now, this suggests that the cells are more likely to self-destruct rather than accumulate DNA damage. 
The authors suggest that their results provide a foundation for further investigation into the role of drugs blocking the GHR to prevent or reduce the incidence of cancer, diabetes and other age-related diseases. So a very, very interesting study. Very fascinating. So the, were they living on average about the same lifetime, the two groups? Yes, there was no difference in average lifespan, but the causes of death and the causes of illness throughout death were very different. It's fascinating. Now, the first image of the Earth's magnetic tail ever has been taken. Now, the northern lights have been in the news this week. And they're caused by the solar wind, which is made up of energetic charged particles thrown off the sun, being trapped by the Earth's magnetic field, crashing into the atmosphere, exciting the air molecules there, making it glow. Other less beautiful side effects can include damaging satellites and even cutting off power grids. Unfortunately for those trying to understand the solar wind, uh, is that the solar wind is affected in electric current. The electric current through the magnetic field, altering where the wind's going to go, which changes the magnetic field again, and the whole thing goes round and round and round. And it becomes a complete computational disaster. And to make it even more difficult, the charged particles in space are essentially invisible. And the effect they have on the magnetic field is only measurable by actually putting the instrument in the magnetic field. So because there's a limit, practical limit, to the number of satellites you can use at once, there's a limit to how much detail you can get of the Earth's magnetic field and the solar wind's interactions with it. Now, the Interstellar Boundary Explorer, or IBEX satellite, was actually designed to look at the heliopores, which is where the sun's magnetic field and solar wind becomes overwhelmed by the galactic magnetic field. At this junction, sometimes a charged nucleus will pick up electrons, becoming a neutral atom. And they, because these are unaffected by uh, magnetic fields, so just continuing in a straight line, unaffected by anything other than gravity. Um, some of these hit the IBEX satellite, and it can work out what direction they came from. So it can build up a picture of where these neutral atoms are coming from, and can build up a picture of the heliopores, this edge of the magnetic field. But sometimes on the IBEX's um, orbit, it can have a look at the, the Earth instead of at looking outwards. So the heliopause is the sort of sphere of influence of the sun. But what IBEX can also occasionally look at is the sphere of influence of the Earth. That's exactly right. Um, they've managed to take a very low resolution image of the magnetic tail or plasma sheet that streams out behind the Earth in a kind of hole behind the Earth where the solar wind is kind of blocked by the Earth. David McCormass is a principal investigator on the mission, has published two images of this tail, and they show it's a very dynamic place, um, with one image showing it as a nice sort of smooth tail and the other one showing a big lump of plasma being sort of pinched off and flying out. Um, and this is happening much closer to the Earth than current theories were expecting. Now, understanding these processes is becoming more and more important as the sun is moving into a more active part of its 11-year solar cycle. And it's an interesting example of an instrument designed to in- investigate something very abstract being used much closer at home. It is interesting how much is going on in what looks to us to be empty space. There's so much activity going on that without missions like this and without these sorts of instruments, we'd never know about. You know, people have got an idea of it, but you can't get the whole picture without getting some kind of image. Thank you, Dave. Now, when somebody loses a limb, although it's possible to replace the missing part with a prosthesis, making it move is another matter entirely. But a technique being pioneered at the University of Chicago could change that. Todd Kuyken has been experimenting with targeted muscle re-innovation surgery. And what he does is to take the nerves that used to supply the severed body part and reroute them into a piece of muscle further up the limb. Now, when the patient thinks about moving the missing body part, the rewired muscle will change its activity instead. And by using electrodes to eavesdrop on that activity, it can be used to control the motors of a prosthetic arm. Chris Smith met with Todd Kuyken and his patient, Sergeant Glenn Lehman, who's actually undergone this procedure. He met them at the AAAS conference in Washington, D.C. Our big challenge is how to control an artificial limb. You lose your arm, and we can make robotic limbs, but how do you tell it what to do? So we've developed a technique that we call targeted muscle re where we've developed a neural interface to capture what the person wants to do with their limb. Essentially, the way it works is we take the major nerves that used to go to the amputated arm, and they're still functional. They send motor commands, and if you stimulate them, you'll feel the missing arm. So we take those nerves and we transfer them to some spare muscles in the residual limb. Those nerves will then grow into those muscles, and when they, when Glenn, for example, thinks close his hand, now his medial biceps contracts. And we can detect a signal from that muscle contraction and tell his artificial hand to close. 
And this way we can get much more function, and it's intuitive. He thinks close his hand, his hand closes. Glenn, can you give us a demonstration? Oh, I can. So, first of all, talk us through what actually happened to you and how long you've been using the prosthesis you've got. November 1st, 2008, I lost my arm. Uh, I was on a combat patrol in Iraq. Uh, they threw an RKG-3 hand grenade at my truck. It penetrated the armor and separated or amputated my arm. After that, I was evacuated and uh, sent through Walter Reed, where I received treatment. Um, Dr. Batchelor and Dr. Kuyken uh, came to me and asked me if I would be a candidate for the uh, targeted muscle re surgery. And then uh, just this last week, I received this arm or went out to uh, RIC in Chicago and trained with them with this arm. Can you show us what it can do? I can raise and lower the elbow. I can rotate the hand so it's in or out. I can open and close the hand, and I can flex the wrist either in or out. And those movements are all controlled by me thinking about my phantom limb. So you're thinking about moving fingers that you no longer have but are present on the prosthesis, obviously, and those thoughts are being translated into what the prosthesis does? Yes, that's correct. Is it easy to learn to do? Uh, I have only used this arm for two weeks, so it was very easy. And what sort of resolution of movements can you manage? If I gave you some peas to pick up, could you do that? I believe I could, yes. Uh, the larger the item, the easier it is to actually grasp. So, I mean, if you uh, like a bottle of water or something like that is easier. Uh, it's very hard to pinch things off a table. If you didn't have this, what would you have instead? And what, in what way has this enriched your life? I would just have a conventional arm. I would be able to operate the elbow and the hand, but it wouldn't be simultaneous. Um, I would only be able to cycle through each thing by switching, um, co-contracting muscles. So it's like the comparison between a minivan and a sports car. It's different categories. Martin, you had to do some of the surgery to make this feasible. What's actually involved in implementing a prosthesis like this in terms of actually rerouting the nerves to muscles and so on? Well, the, the performance of the surgery is actually very simple. Uh, the anatomy is predictable, and the procedures of transferring the severed nerve to a, a healthy piece of muscle is it, it's quite simple. And how long does it take patients to actually begin to use and work one of these prostheses? Well, since we put the severed nerve so close to the new muscle, it only takes a couple of months before we start getting some contraction of the muscle. It may take uh, six months or maybe even a year before it fully matures, and the connection between the brain and that newly innervated muscle is plateaued and is what it's going to be. And just coming back to you, Todd, in terms of actually how the, the process works, so there are actually physically electrodes which are listening to what the muscle is doing when Glenn thinks what he wants to do. That's correct. We have sets of little electrodes that are like antennas listening to his muscles. If he had had his injury 20 years ago compared with very, very recently, you got to him when it was a fresh injury, would that have made a difference to whether this could be done? It, it may have. That answer isn't really known. Um, we're comfortable doing the surgery for five or ten years after injury um, in a younger patient, but uh, what, there may be a limit someday that we'll find that, that we don't want to cross over. We know that the nerves are still viable for decades after the injury, but how good they are at regenerating is a question. And what about sensation? Because at the moment he obviously can see what he's doing, but he can't feel what he's doing. What about taking it into that domain next? We have been able to provide hand sensation for some of our amputees. What we do is cut the nerve to the skin over these nerve transfers, and then the hand sensation nerves will grow into this residual limb skin. So when you touch it, it feels like you're touching the missing hand. It's very exciting for us because it gives us the potential of putting sensors in the prosthesis to see when you touch something or how hard you're squeezing and feed that information back so that the patient feels that they're getting that touch or pressure on their missing hand. And if this prosthetic is like a sports car compared to the traditional minivan, then just imagine what it would be like when you can feel what your prosthetic is touching as well. That was Todd Kuyken and Sergeant Glenn Lehman speaking to Chris Smith at the AAAS conference in Washington this week. Now, Alaskan black bears do not hibernate in the same way as other smaller mammals, and an understanding of how they achieve their winter's rest may actually help to improve medical care and open the door to deep space travel.
Hibernation is a very useful behaviour in challenging environments. By slowing the metabolic rate, an animal is able to cut its energy costs dramatically and survive a harsh winter on bodily reserves alone. In general, metabolic rate slows by 50% for every 10 degrees Celsius drop in body temperature. Most of the hibernating animals studied so far have been things small mammals like hedgehogs. Larger animals like bears have been a lot harder to study due to the technical limitations. But now, researchers at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, along with colleagues from Stanford University, have had a unique chance to study five Alaskan bears captured by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game as nuisance animals. Oyvind Toyen and colleagues allowed the bears to hibernate in artificial dens, which were kitted out with infrared cameras, activity detectors and other remote sensing devices, and they monitored them throughout five months of hibernation. They measured oxygen concentration in the air as a marker of metabolic rate, and they surgically implanted radio transmitters inside the bears to report on body temperature and heart activity. Now, this allowed them to see that black bears actually reduced their metabolic rate to just 25% of its normal level, despite actually staying quite warm, around 33 degrees on average. Their heart rate dropped from around 55 to just 14 beats per minute, but they showed marked sinus arrhythmia, variation in frequency relative to breathing. This suggests that the bears have a mechanism in place to divorce metabolic rate from body temperature, allowing them to spend very long periods without eating, without drinking, without defecating, but without the need to be cold. On leaving hibernation in spring, the bears did not instantly return to their high metabolic rate as you might expect. It actually developed over the next two to three weeks of activity. Now also, unlike us humans who lose muscle and bone during a period of activity, bears do not seem to suffer any muscle or bone density loss. So as well as improving our understanding of how large animals like bears cope with harsh conditions, this could help us to develop some novel medical interventions. Brian Barnes, the senior author of the study, said, If we could discover the genetic and molecular basis for this protection, there is the possibility that we could derive new therapies and medicines to use on humans to prevent osteoporosis, prevent atrophy of muscle, or even to place injured people in a type of suspended or reduced animation until they can be delivered to advanced medical care. It may sound like science fiction, of course, but suspended or reduced animation is also exactly what we're going to need to send humans on very long missions to try and get outside of our solar system. Interesting, yes. Uh, I've got a story here which is rather less deep. A mystery of moving stones on a perfectly flat, dry lake bed in the upper end of Death Valley. There are some strange rocks that is sailing stones which are dotted around an otherwise smooth lake bed. Some of them weigh up to 36 kilograms, but behind them are tracks, sometimes tens of metres long, as if they'd been moving. These tracks can be straight or zigzagged, and some of the stones have been marked, and their positions seem to are definitely moving, so it's not some strange kind of wind effect. But no one has ever seen one of these stones move. The movements seem to occur on the rare occasions when the lake is covered with a shallow layer of water, and there's a strong wind, and the temperature is very low. Um, Both icebergs and high winds have been suggested as ways of moving the stones, but never of them have really kind of seemed decisive and actually to explain what's going on. Now, Ralph Lorenz, a scientist at John Hopkins University, has come up with a new explanation, a neat combination of both. The lake occasionally floods a couple of inches deep, and as it does so, a small iceberg forms around the stone. And as the water level increases slightly, because ice floats, this gives the stone some lift, reducing the friction with the ground. And this allows winds to be able to push the stones along gently, forming the long tracks. They've done some experiments which support their hypothesis, although it'll be very hard to know if this is exactly what's happening until someone actually sees one of these things moving. But they only happen sort of once or twice a year, and it's a really unpleasant place to hang out and watch. But basically, mystery solved. We we hope so. It seems to make sense. But again, we need the evidence. Um, Their excuse for doing this, I think is probably the right (laughs) word, is that studying areas like the racetrack player have um, been useful in understanding places like shallow lakes on Saturn's moon Titan, where there are some hydrocarbon lakes rather than water lakes, which occasionally seem to dry out and should have very similar behaviours. Well, thank you very much, Dave. And if you would like to read up on anything that we've covered so far this week, the references and transcripts for each of the news stories we've discussed are online at thenakedscientists.com slash news. Reacting to the world's best science, The Naked Scientists.
You're listening to The Naked Scientists with me, Ben Valsler, and with Dave Ansell. Still to come, we'll join an international team of scientists as they fly around the country analysing our atmosphere. Scientists are keeping a close eye on the West Antarctic ice sheet because if it melts, we're in big trouble from the resulting rise in sea level. But how vulnerable is it? Dr David Barnes from the British Antarctic Survey has been trying to find out by studying small marine creatures called bryozoans. Planet Earth podcast presenter Richard Hollingham joined David to take a closer look at how life on a small rock can tell us about climate change. What we're looking at is a small rock that's been collected from the continental shelf of the Weddell Sea. And these small rocks are are oases for life that encrusts other substrates. And it's it's covered by animals, including bryozoans. Just first off, before we look down the microscope, it's really sort of half fist size, greyish rock with these white spiral patterns on it. These are the bryozoans. They are. If we looked at them when they were alive, they would be uh, brightly coloured. Lots of nice oranges, browns, uh, greens, yellows. But when they dry out, they go white. And if you looked at them under the microscope, as we're about to do, you can see that these are fighting each other and and we're looking at an an ancient battleground. An ancient battleground. OK, let's have a a look through the, the microscope here. Just adjust that. When they're on the rock... They look like someone's drawn spirals, but when you look under the microscope, they're very much three-dimensional, almost like bubble wrap. The spiral is formed by them growing modules out, and they're like corals in miniature, so they're going to grow up a vast sort of empire of lots and lots of these identical modules, but eventually they'll run out of space and they'll meet another set of modules that are growing, and it's like two armies that have met each other on a battleground, and then they will start to either fight or give up because they're too evenly matched, or perhaps even if they're very, very closely related in the same species, they'll fuse together to form a giant sort of superorganism. Now, you went looking for these around the coast of Antarctica. What did you find? What surprised you? We found that if we looked at all of the suites of species that lived in a particular site, in a particular area, and scaling up to a whole sea, the Weddell Sea, we wanted to try and see where was that most similar to. Now, logically, you would expect it to be most similar to the areas nearby. These animals find it hard to get around. And... To some extent, that's what we found, but with one big exception. And that was? And that was the Weddell and the Ross Seas. These seas are a long way apart. They're separated by one of the three big lumps of ice that exist on the planet, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. And we don't know how stable that has been in Earth's past, but we need to know because it could be crucial for sea level rise. The fact that these two areas that are maybe 1,500 miles apart, separated by this massive block of ice, was a real surprise. And it tells us that at some point, those have been recently connected. So what's the significance, then, of these two seas, thousands of miles apart, being connected? So if we want to understand how our planet is going to respond to the warming that's going on at the moment, which is fairly unprecedented in the last 30 million years. We need to know how ice sheets have responded to climate in the past. We we can only project the future, but we actually have data on the past. So we can go back and look at how each of the three big ice sheets has responded to past temperatures that we have a very good record of through ice cores and, and sediment cores. If we look at each of those, the East Antarctic ice sheet, the biggest by far, is very, very stable. The other two, we aren't quite so sure on, and a lot of attention is focused on Greenland. But if we're right, it might mean that the West Antarctic ice sheet is the least stable of those three and the most important to projected sea level rise with our temperatures. And so getting an idea of where and when that collapse becomes very, very important. For example, the last interglacial was a very brief one that was very warm. And that's like our current time now, brief but warm. And so if it did collapse in the last interglacial, that means that all of our previous thoughts were wrong, that it was too brief for the ice to collapse. Well, if it wasn't, then that's an important look forward to our immediate future. David Barnes from the British Antarctic Survey talking to Richard Hollingham. And you can hear the latest edition of the Planet Earth podcast, as well as links to other Planet Earth online resources at thenakedscientists.com slash planet earth. 
You're listening to Naked Scientists with Dave Ansell and Ben Valsler. Now, how do we study the atmosphere? We have a vast array of tools and chemical tricks that we can rely on, but the atmosphere is a very dynamic thing, so sampling the air in just one place can only tell us so much. So now an international consortium of scientists and organisations including the Met Office and the Natural Environment Research Council have taken to the skies in a modified BAE 146 airliner to explore what happens to atmospheric chemistry once the sun goes down. Uh, Mission to mission two. Uh, Just to say that we're uh, just about to enter the top of the cloud layer, so uh, instruments need to perhaps just be aware of that. Okay, copy that. Mission to instrument scientists, we're descending hopefully into the polluted layer. Can people please? The Renoco campaign, that's short for Role of Nighttime Chemistry in Controlling the Oxidising Capacity of the Atmosphere, allows scientists from all over Europe to study the atmosphere in a unique way. Now, atmospheric chemistry changes when the sun, a driver of many chemical reactions, goes down. So, by setting off on a modified aeroplane at dusk and following the plumes of pollution into the night, the scientists on board can get a far better understanding of the pervasiveness and importance of nighttime chemical processes. But to know when and where to track this pollution, the researchers rely on weather reports from the Met Office as part of their daily teleconference. Here's Dave Kindred. Um, I think it's going to be looking and chasing the, the clearer patches uh, after today. I think today is going to be the best flying day we've got in the next several and I think um, plans to fly along the English Channel. I think that's still the best area for today, and around the southwest approach is maybe the Bristol Channel. Armed with this knowledge, Cambridge University's Professor Rod Jones, a mission scientist on the Renoco campaign, can start to make decisions about the course that they will take. What I'm going to be doing is sitting next to the pilots in the cockpit. Uh, I'll have a certain amount of information from the crew and the, and the scientists at the back telling me what the atmosphere looks like and we're going to be making judgments about where to go on the basis of what we actually see because we're using forecasts to give us a good idea about where we should be broadly and we're going to use the measurements we make on the aeroplane to try and refine that and put it exactly in the right spot. That was Rod Jones. Karen Hornsby from the University of Leicester is one of the scientists on board. Because we're looking at the boundary layer which is quite close to the surface we have to go as close to the surface as we possibly can. So during the day over the sea, we can get down as low as 50 feet, which um, is quite exciting when you're stood up, strapped to your rack for safety, looking out the window and seeing the waves whipping by. But obviously at night, it's more dangerous to go that low, so we've been flying more like 1,500 feet over the ocean, and it's still fairly exciting. The plane itself is packed with scientific instruments, each measuring, sampling or monitoring a different aspect of the atmosphere. Ruth Purvis from the University of York introduces us to the core chemistry instruments. This is instruments that's on the aircraft every time it flies, so it tends to be part of what we call a core instrument fit. And we have an ozone analyzer, a carbon monoxide analyzer and an NOx analyzer, that's nitrogen dioxide. The most important two on this rack really are the ozone and the carbon monoxide monitor. And these are both key atmospheric tracers. We have carbon monoxide, which is what we call an anthropogenic tracer, and that just means that it's a man-made pollutant really. You will see high amounts of carbon monoxide in all kinds of plumes that we're chasing. And the ozone tends to be in really strong polluted plumes, so we can use both these um, measurements to see when we're in the plume, and they're really good markers for that. Sarah Moller, also from the University of York, runs the NOx or NOx rack. Nitrogen oxide um, are generally produced wherever the temperature is high enough for nitrogen and oxygen in the air to join together to form nitrogen oxide, so that's combustion, anything like that. So when you see pollutant plumes, they often include NOx, and that's what we measure with this instrument. So what it does is it sucks air in from the outside and it makes NO2 in the excited state, which then gives off light, and we measure how much light it gives off. And that tells us how much NO or NO2 we've got in the air. During the day, you have NO and NO2, but at night, you don't get NO formed because it's formed by sunlight changing NO2 into NO. So at night, you would expect to see all NO2. So when we do dusk or dawn flights, you see at dusk, the NO starts to disappear as the sunlight goes and all the processes convert the NO that's there into NO2. 
and then at dawn you see as the sun comes up you start to get the NO2 fertilised and you start to get NO being produced. Other compounds of nitrogen are also important, as Jennifer Muller from Manchester University explains. The SIMS stands for Chemical Ionisation Mass Spectrometer. So we're using a compound called methyl iodide and produce iodine ions, so that's I minus, to then we have them in a chamber reacting with the air samples from the outside. The I minus locks onto particular compounds that we're interested in. So one compound, for example, that's also important for this campaign is nitric acid. So nitric acid is HNO3. And basically, the I minus hangs on to the HNO3, and we can see that in our mass spectrum at a particular mass. So the HNO3, um, the nitric acid, is uh, one of the nitrogen compounds that we're interested in, the focus being on nitrogen compounds during the night and how they react. In addition to nitrogen, the Renoco campaign looks at a range of other important chemicals. Hannah Bunyan is from the University of Leeds. Phage stands for fluorescence assay by gas expansion and it's a low pressure technique that samples air from the outside of the aircraft, so ambient air. We draw it into a detection cell and then we excite the molecules that we're interested in using a laser and we want to measure the concentrations of the OH and HO2 radicals. So we tune our laser wavelength so that we can excite the OH radical and then we measure the fluorescence that is produced when the radical relaxes uh, and that gives us a measure of concentration. And the OH and HO2 together collectively they're called HOX. During the day, OH is a really important oxidizer of hydrocarbons and things like that. And it's made by uh, photolysis of ozone. But during the night, there's more ambiguity about what its role is and how it works. Uh, it's possible that it's produced by the reactions of ozone with alkenes, but it's also possible that the nitrate radical which has been measured during these flights is also important. So basically we're trying to give some contribution to how much the OH radical contributes to oxidation at night. So far it's, uh, it's gone pretty well. My name's Karen Hornsby and I'm a research associate at the University of Leicester working on the peroxy radical chemical amplifier, or short name PERCA. And my rack basically consists of two half-height metal 19-inch racks and within it we store several gas cylinders containing compressed air, nitrogen and nitrogen oxide. We sample gas through the skin of the aircraft using two glass inlets which then go to two detectors which tell me how much nitrogen dioxide I'm generating from the peroxy radicals that I'm converting into nitrogen dioxide. And Gavin McMeeking from the University of Manchester is not measuring gases in the atmosphere but particles. This is the aerosol mass spectrometer. It measures small particles that are hanging around in the, uh, the atmosphere. It's a little different from most of everything else on the aircraft in that it doesn't look at gas phase species, it's looking at these particles. The aerosols have a lot of impacts on the atmosphere and air quality, and particularly for the things Renoco is interested in. For one thing, they're uh, an important place where nitrogen ends up. A lot of it can basically turn into nitric acid and eventually go into the particle phase and form things like ammonium nitrate, and this instrument can measure that. And then the other thing is the aerosols themselves can be surface sites for a lot of different chemical reactions that happen in the atmosphere. So that's one of the things that you know, we're interested in trying to characterize is how many particles are around different parts of the flight, where we are in different you know, altitudes and that kind of thing, and then also how does that change with time, and are we seeing uh, you know, increases in the amount of, say, nitrogen that's in the particles uh, as the evening progresses or as it gets colder, as it gets more humid and other factors like that. The Renoco campaign took to the air for their last of their winter flights a few weeks ago and it will take time to understand all the data they've collected. Before their final flight, Michelle Kane explained what they've been able to see so far. We've got a mixture of um, different weather conditions. To start with, we had front coming through and quite strong flow as a consequence. So we saw some really good plumes off of... Birmingham, Manchester and Edinburgh, so we were able to track those plumes as they came off the coast. Now we've got a bit more, well, a very high pressure system just stagnating over us. It's, it's not a strong flow, it's quite slack winds and we've managed to get one flight the other day uh, over the English Channel. It was quite messy, uh, we saw lots of pollution coming off of the, the UK as a whole but embedded in that the London plume. That was a dust flight, so we saw the transition 
from daytime to nighttime. So all the photochemistry just switches off and you see different things starting to appear after dark. So that was very interesting and we're going to try and repeat that today. So it's all in all been pretty successful and we've been quite lucky with the weather, I have to say. Start of descent. What a fantastic mission that sounds like. We will look forward to finding out what they've discovered sometime in the future. Many, many thanks go to Rod Jones at Cambridge University and to Doug Anderson at Cranfield University for their essential help with making that happen. Distilling the best science. The Naked Scientists. You're listening to The Naked Scientists with me, Ben Valsler, and with Dave Ansell. Now, another reason to try and understand atmospheric chemistry is in case comes a time when we have to try and do some geoengineering. If global warming gets so bad, we have to actually do something about it physically, perhaps by adding some chemicals to the atmosphere, which will cool it down. Dr. Peter Bracicki is in, in the Department of Chemistry at Cambridge University and joins us now. Peter, if we really had to do something like this, what sort of approaches are there? I think one of the major projects would be to inject uh, particle precursors into the atmosphere. And I think most commonly people think about things like SO2, like volcanoes would do, and then basically have aerosols forming and those aerosols reflecting sunlight back to the space. So this is, I guess, Mount Pinatobo was the big example of this. There was a big volcanic eruption which shot a load of dust really high up in the atmosphere yes, and actually you, affected the climate. Yes, you're exactly right. So Mount Pinatobo is one of our big case studies, so to speak, where basically a volcano went off and injected lots of SO2 into the atmosphere, aerosol was formed, and basically on these aerosols, we had then interesting reactions with ozone. So ozone actually went down after Pinatubo erupted and then recovered afterwards, giving us a nice chemical trace into the atmosphere. But also, obviously, it had basically repercussions on the heating rates in the atmosphere. So Pinatubo cooled globally the atmosphere, even though it basically caused something which is called winter warming. So actually, one of the winter after Pinot Tube actually was slightly warmer on average in our latitudes and in our areas than it usually would be without the Pinot Tube explosion. So is this because the dust is effectively acting as an insulator? So if you're somewhere very warm, it's keeping the heat out. But if you're in, the, in deep winter, it's going to keep some of the heat in? Yes, it's true. That that's, that's part of the thing as well. But but as we've discussed today earlier, there will be changes in terms of the circulation. Also, the circulation patterns obviously have sort of some kind of consequences for what kind of temperatures we have locally and for the local weather we experience in our region. And so those circulation changes affect us in a way that we end up with sort of some kind of slightly warmer northern hemisphere. So the circulation in the atmosphere is sort of being driven by temperature differences. The equator is very, very warm, so air is rising there. And other places where it's colder, the air is sinking. And if you affect the amount of light and therefore heat which is coming into an area, you're going to affect the circulation with respect to that. That's exactly right. And also the vertical structure is very complicated. Obviously, where you have the aerosol locally high up in the atmosphere at 15, 17 kilometres, it actually basically causes local warming in the atmosphere. Whereas obviously lower down towards the surface, basically where you have the aerosol, because it's basically scattering light back to the, out of the atmosphere, you actually have local cooling. So you change the vertical structure of temperature and you also change the gradient from north to south. And that basically then acts as a sort of regulator on basically how the circulation will change. So it's having effects all over this very, very complicated system. Yes. I, so you're, you're attempting to model some of these effects. That's exactly right. So we are running big climate models at the Centre for Atmospheric Science here at the uh, Department of Chemistry at Cambridge University, together with the Met Office. And it's basically also one of the Met Office models that we are using and developing together. And we're looking at basically what man peanut tuber does to things like ozone, circulation, climate at the surface, but also obviously overall what kind of large transport changes are in the stratosphere and how basically the aerosol has been vectored around and where basically the aerosol eventually left the atmosphere and for how long it was around. So I guess one thing you'd be really worried about doing something like this deliberately is if you're going to produce a minor, what would look like a minor side effect with respect to the whole globe, but which with respect to the person who's living there, it could be absolutely disastrous. Exactly. I think that, that, that always what, what, what could happen if, if you basically twiddle around with the climate system, you, you might basically get something right like global mean temperature, which is sort of some kind of metric that, that obviously is important, but doesn't really tell you anything about your livelihood locally in, in, in any given country. And if you basically change the circulation such that monsoon would fail in India, then it would have very severe consequences for people there. 
So would you be able to possibly tune how you're injecting your particles to reflect the light to possibly affect the weather local, relatively locally? So in some areas you could increase the rainfall or decrease it? That, that might be possible, but it is very, very complicated because bear in mind that, that basically the circulation in the stratosphere, which basically is a part of the atmosphere, about 15 kilometers, is very, very global. So it acts on slightly slower time scales than what we see in the troposphere in terms of circulation. But it's so global that basically within months, basically aerosol is brought from the tropics to high latitudes. So whatever you do in, in, in the stratosphere, you have to think big. You have to think on the glo- global scale. And again, it might have repercussions then on, on a regional scale in the troposphere. Is this sort of thing ever likely to actually happen? Or do you think the kind of legal effects and the general worry, the, the worry of actually something going horribly wrong would stop it? Uh, personally, I think it, it's not very likely to happen. It's something that we need to study and would help us to understand how the atmosphere works. But as you say, there are so many legal issues, ethical issues, that I don't think we, we, we will do it actually in the end. But then again, I guess if the, actu- if the world was in a really, really bad state due to global warming, it, the side effects might be less than the possible what's happening anyway. It might be. <laughs> it's very, very hard to say. And I, I think it's basically important that we talk about those things and think about those things. But I think we have to keep in mind whatever you do, there are winners and losers. And to regulate this in terms of some kind of global... <laughs> <laughs> world citizen view is, is I think an incredibly difficult thing to do Brilliant thank you very much Peter that's Peter Bracicker and he'll help us for the rest of the show so if you have any questions please get in touch But now if it did come to it that we felt we needed to alter our atmosphere and we've just heard all sorts of reasons why hopefully we'll never have to how physically could we do it? Mira and Dave explore the engineering behind one option and that's pumping chemicals up an absolutely enormous pipe. The SPICE project, which stands for the Stratospheric Particle Injection for Climate Engineering, is being undertaken by the universities of Cambridge, Bristol and Oxford looking into the technology of geoengineering Now, this week, Dave and I have come along to the University of Cambridge Engineering Department to find out more about the engineering aspects of this project. And one engineer on the SPICE project who's looking into getting this up into our stratosphere is Dr Hugh Hunt. Now, Hugh, first of all, how would you even go about designing this? Well, Mira, you might think if you want to get some particles up there, you could, say, take them up in aircraft or you might send them up in balloons. But if you actually sit down and work out the sums of what's possible, that narrows down the scope. The technology that we're looking at is having a a balloon right up in the stratosphere, 20 kilometres high. That's twice as high as a normal cruising commercial aircraft, holding a pipe like a big garden hose. Now, this hose would be just like a garden hose, 20 kilometres long, and we'd pump stuff up the pipe. And the nice thing about it is that we can really have a knob, if you like, which we can control to adjust the rate in which we inject these particles. Now, this sounds reasonably simple in that it's a balloon with a tube and you're sending things up the tube, but you are also sending it 20 kilometres up into the stratosphere. We are in one of the workshops here in engineering and you've got a, um, a large helium balloon here with a thin metal chain hanging off it. In order to try and understand how a 20 kilometre tether works with a balloon up in the stratosphere, we really do need to make sure we understand smaller scale experiments. So this is great. We've got this chain. It's just an ordinary bathroom chain. And there's the balloon. You can see it up there. It's, it's, it's quite big, as you say. It's getting up to a metre in diameter. It sits up there a few metres up. And you can see that if I just give it a, a whack on the side, the chain starts to wobble all over the place and the balloon starts to bounce up and down. Well, this is going to be happening on a 20-kilometre scale. And the tube has got to be able to take the pressure of 20 kilometres worth of weight of fluid. And reinforced garden hose, well, we know what that looks like, but the most important thing to notice is that it's really, it's reinforced. So if we're going to have to hold back the thousands of atmospheres of pressure, which we need to pump stuff up this pipe, we're going to have to design the reinforcement really well. But weight's going to be a really big problem because the heavier the tube is, the bigger the balloon you need, and also the more tension you've got in that tube. Yeah, so the whole weight of this thing is going to be you know, a few hundred tonnes. That's the, um, the weight of several double, double-decker buses. So imagine how big a helium balloon do you need to hold several double-decker buses, a big balloon. We're looking at a balloon which is possibly one or 200 metres in diameter. It's about the same size as uh, the Wembley Stadium. 
So that's an extremely large balloon. But so, I mean, we've addressed the fact that you need to take the weight into consideration, the strength. But what about actually pumping things up to that height and actually spraying it out into the stratosphere? If we're pumping at several thousand atmospheres and we're having to pump up an abrasive substance, for instance, it's an engineering challenge. The pressures are high, the pipe has to be designed to take those pressures. And then at the very top, we've got to disperse the material into the stratosphere through some kind of nozzle. Now, if the nozzle were to get blocked, it's not like your inkjet printer where you can just replace the cartridge. We won't be able to go up there to do anything. So we've got to make this thing work reliably for months, perhaps years at a time. And we're pumping tens of thousands of kilograms of material every day through this pipe. So it's a big challenge. And what about actually launching the balloon up to such a height? The real issues are that you've got your balloon folded up. It's a bit like a sleeping bag in a sack and you're trying to get it out of the sack and you're trying to fill it up with helium or hydrogen and get it launched and take it up through the windy atmosphere and get it through whatever weather's going on and get it up to this safe altitude of 20 kilometres where in the stratosphere the wind conditions are really much gentler. I guess also the temperature is changing a lot between ground and um, the stratosphere as well. Yeah, well, one thing we have to try and prevent happening is uh, for any ice build-up on the tether. Do we have to uh, make sure that the tether stays warm or do we have to put surface coatings on it to make sure the ice um, doesn't form? And I guess one way to really see if it's possible is to do a trial. Yeah, that's right. And we, we've got plans in uh, October, November this year to do a, a test at one kilometre. Now, of course, this is going to be a, perhaps quite a high-profile exercise. And before we're going to get permission to do this trial, we're undertaking a public engagement exercise, and that's happening as we speak. Well, the design engineer um, on the SPICE project working on this trial is Kirsty Kuo. So to try and understand better some of the engineering challenges that are involved, we're planning to pump up water up this pipe at a rate similar to what you get out a garden hose. So though the pressures aren't as high as they'd be for the 20-kilometre system, it will still help us to understand what type of pump we use and how well this water flows up the pipe and whether it causes the balloon and the pipe to move any more than what the wind does. So you're doing this as an experiment, essentially. So what do you not quite understand which you're hoping to learn by doing this? What we really want to understand better is how the tether moves in the wind. So we know that if you have a balloon, a helium balloon, and you blow on it, it's going to sway from side to side. Now, is that an important issue when launching one of these balloons? Will we see as the balloon goes up to one kilometre that the balloon sways from side to side? And how much will it sway? We don't really know how to predict that. Now, Hugh... This design is just one option in the approaches to climate change, but there must be other uses if you're able to get a balloon to that height as well. I can imagine that things that, are, that satellites are used for presently maybe could be transferred to a, a tethered balloon. Communications, meteorological research and so on. So once we crack the technology for a, a tethered balloon at 20 kilometres, I can really imagine that there'll be uh, lots of applications. So the tricks used to pump chemicals high up into the atmosphere could also prove very useful for a whole host of other applications. That was Hugh Hunt talking to Mira Senthalingam. You are listening to The Naked Scientists with me, Ben Valsler, with Dave Ansell and with our guest, Dr Peter Braceker from the University of Cambridge. Peter, we'll, we've got some great questions that will come to you in just a minute. But first, Dave, Mike in Colchester has uh, called in about the space story that we were talking about earlier. He wants to know what is the furthest man-made item in space that's still sending data back to Earth. What do we have out there? The furthest one out there, which overtook quite recently, is Voyager 1. Um, This is sitting out at about 116 AU, so that's 116 times further out from the Sun than the Earth is. Because 1 AU is the distance between Earth and the Sun. That's right, so it's about 17.2 billion kilometres. Right. (laughs) Um, It's sitting out there. It's always running out of power very slowly. By about 2025, it's not going to have any power and the poor thing's going to die. But it's just been going through this heliopause I was talking about earlier in about the last year. All magnetic fields are starting to change radically at the moment and it's still doing important science even after 25 30 years and it's served us very very well in its time thank you dave peter we've had a question from umer who uh, wrote to us on twitter that's at naked scientists he wants to know why it is that clouds come in all sorts of different shades of gray 
So basically, the color of the cloud is determined by the size of the droplets in it. And as we experience when we have rain, there are different sizes of raindrops around. So there's different sizes of little particles in the cloud, so the droplets in the cloud. And depending on the size, the scattering changes, and so the color you perceive the cloud at changes. And so basically, you see it in different shades of gray. And it, it always feels instinctively like we can predict whether we're likely to get rain from looking at the color of a cloud. Is that actually true? It's somehow true, I think, because well, usually the ones with the bigger particles tend to basically appear much darker. And so if you get the feeling, oh, dark, big, fat clouds coming, that, that certainly is a good sign for rain. Excellent, thank you. The same person, Umer, again on Twitter, also asked how sudden gusts of air are created. Now, of course, these differ from the big currents of air that we were talking about earlier that are to do with heat exchange. He means just the little gusts that, that blow your hair around, that sort of thing. How, how do they actually happen? I think, as, as we've heard from uh, one of the scientists at the farm aircraft measuring the atmosphere, if you go into the boundary layer and basically things interact with the surface, you get lots of vortices. And so these vortices interact with each other. And when you basically feel the gust, it's, it's usually one of the vortices peeling off and, and, and shedding its energy. So it's a little bit of turbulence, it's really. It's turbulence, yes. Excellent. Um, Dave, you, you might also want to join in on this one. Megan Wilson on Facebook asked, why is it cold in space? when the sun is hundreds of thousands of degrees C? Well, there's two, I mean, the sun is incredibly hot, but the sun isn't throughout the whole of space. So when you're sitting in space, you're getting hit by about the same amount of sunlight. If you're on the Earth's orbit, about the same type of amount of sunlight as you get if you're sitting on Earth. But the rest of you can see deep, dark space, which is only at about, it's at about minus 270 degrees centigrade. So you radiate heat into the re- deep, dark space because everything, anything warm glows in the infrared and you're getting hit by sunlight. And the balance of those two is the temperature you'll sit at. And about the Earth's orbit, I think it's a bit below the Earth's cent- sort of north degree centigrade or a bit below that, isn't it? Yeah. Peter? Um, another question from Facebook, this one from Ray Etherton. And this is related, really, but he wants to know, Peter, I'll put it to you, why does the moon have no atmosphere at all? I think the moon obviously is, is, is just too small. There's not enough gravity there to basically keep an atmosphere. And, and so because the Earth obviously is much, much bigger, it basically is able to keep the, the atmosphere gravitational together. And so that's why we're enjoying the benefit of the atmosphere. And if we can do this in, in maybe 30 seconds, uh, Alexa Ogno wants to know, is there more water in the atmosphere than there is in the oceans? What do you think? It's, it's definitely more water in the, in the uh, oceans. So the atmosphere does hold a considerable amount of water, but compared to all the oceans, it, it, it's still pretty, pretty small. Thank you very much. That's Peter Brasica. He's from the Department of Chemistry at Cambridge University. Thank you very much for joining us. But now Thank it's you. time for our question of the week with Diana O'Carroll. This week, how fast before you can fly? My name is Jane Britton Long and I'm from Newnham on Seven in Gloucestershire. Ever since I did my physics O level in 1985, I have wanted to know the following. If you have a car with a rear spoiler bar on the boot area, most pimp depot customised cars have this bar, it looks like a shopping trolley handle on the back, and a man of average height, say six feet, and weight, say ten stone, if he took hold of this bar and the car drove away, how fast would the car need to go before the man is airborne? I know that the outcome would not be pleasant, but theoretically I just find this really interesting. So is this something you can do in a Ford Fiesta or a Bugatti Veyron? I'm Hugh Hunt from Cambridge University Engineering Department. Yeah, well, look, I suppose if you're trying to figure out how fast you need to go in a car and somebody's at the grab hold of the back and you're trying to lift them up off the ground, it's all about aerodynamic drag. Now, aerodynamic drag, there's a formula for it, which is a half row V squared, multiplied by frontal area, multiplied by a drag coefficient. Now, rho is the density of air, and that's 1.2 kilogram per cubic metre. That's easy. V is the speed of the car in metres per second. A is the frontal area of the person. Now, I don't know, let's make a rough guess. It's a 10 stone person, so they're reasonably slim. A couple of metres high, say on average 20 centimetres wide, you know, wider in the middle, thinner at the legs. I don't know, it's as good a guess as any. So that gives them a frontal area of 0.4 square metres. The drag coefficient, well, we need to make another guess here because the air behind the car is very turbulent. It's impossible to know what the drag coefficient would be, but let's say 0.5. That's a reasonable figure, I think. So if you do the sums, so that the drag force is roughly equal to the weight of the person, then you end up 
needing to drive at about 160 miles an hour. Well, is that reasonable? Look, it's such a, a complicated airflow behind the car. And there are questions about when does drag become lift? Once the person's out at an angle of 45 degrees, then you might start thinking, well, we need to calculate the lift on the person rather than the drag on the person. Well, we could have lots of arguments over this over a few beers if you want, but um, at least that's my start of calculation. So you'd need to use a pretty powerful car to get someone off the ground, going at about 160 miles an hour. On the forum, board chemist recommended holding the spoiler upside down, and Clifford Kay pointed out that the car could create all sorts of interesting vortices behind it. Now, after you've been hanging onto the back of a car travelling at high speeds, you might get a bit of muscle cramp. Hello, my name is Glenn. I'm in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I would like to know what causes leg cramps and how can I avoid them? What is cramp and how does one prevent it? Answers to chris at thenakedscientists.com or write on the forum and get talked about. And the address is thenakedscientists.com forward slash forum. Thank you very much, Diana. So if you've got any idea about the causes of and the treatments for cramp, then do drop Diana a line. You can reach her on our usual email address. That's chris at thenakedscientists.com. But that's pretty much all we have time for on this week's Naked Scientists. Many thanks to Peter Brasica for joining us here, Rod Jones and Doug Anderson for making the package about the Renoco airplane happen, and of course to Hugh Hunt, who joined us for both Naked Engineering and Question of the Week this week. Thank Thank you very much, Hugh. Thanks also to our production team, Mira Senthalingam, Tom Simpkins and Diana O'Carroll. Next week, we'll be looking into how exercise can affect our bones to make them denser, stronger and less prone to things like osteoarthritis, as well as how scanning our bones could help to predict which of us are more likely to get fractures in the future. If you've got any questions for us, then do get in touch. It's chris at thenakedscientists.com, thenakedscientists slash Facebook, or just tweet at Naked Scientists. The Naked Scientists comes to you from Cambridge University and is supported by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC, the Natural Environment Research Council and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at thenakedscientists.com. 